this morning, I do want to get back to our study that we've been studying here in Romans chapter 7. And let's remember that this entire book was written by the hand of Tertius, who was the amanuensis for Paul. He was directed by Paul, who described himself as a slave of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, having been set apart for the gospel of God. And he was writing to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. And he was writing words of grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to join him this morning at the beginning of Romans chapter 7 where we read, Or do you not know, brothers, for I'm speaking to those who know the law. Now he's not just talking the law of Moses. But he's talking about the law of God that was given explicitly, yes, in the law of Moses, but also written in the hearts of the Gentiles, in in their actions. Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is master over a person as long as he lives? For the married woman has been bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies... She is released from the law concerning the husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is freed from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. So, my brothers, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now, We've been released from the law, having died to that by which we were constrained, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit and not in oldness of the letter. It is in these last few verses that we find ourselves wrapping up this first partition of Paul's great exposition regarding the Christian's relationship with the law. And why we are no longer under the law, but now under grace, doesn't result in lawless and unrighteous living. And we cannot fail to notice that to the mind of Paul, our present relationship to the law, even the larger question of sanctification, is directly, it is completely bound up in a proper understanding of the miracle of salvation. For I trust you will recall last time we talked that we realized just how unable a person who is yet in the flesh is is unable to overcome their sorry estate all on their own. Having begun in the flesh, to remain in the flesh is to be opposed to the Spirit of God. It is to live a life still married to and under the authority and rule of the law just as such a person remains under the reign and the realm of sin. And I want us to reread this last verse we're we're looking at here, the sixth verse again, and observe the absolute grandeur of it. Just as last time, we emphasized the negative aspect of life in the flesh. In this verse, we celebrate the positive of life lived in the Spirit. So let's look at it specifically. But now, having been released from the law, having died to that by which we were constrained, so that we serve 
in newness of the spirit and not in oldness of the letter. I trust you will immediately recognize once again that this is a description of the Christian now. In this present time, in this present age. But now, Paul writes, is something that we must enthusiastically embrace, even as he did. For in this statement, Paul is describing every person who is in Christ Jesus. And this is something we must understand. This is not just some Christians. All who are in Christ Jesus, are described in this one statement. Once again, if you're a true believer in, G in Christ Jesus, this is true of you. And conversely, if this is not true of you, you cannot be a Christian at all. So for those keeping score, there are still absolutely no commands in Romans 7 so far. No commands at all. These first six verses only indicate what is true of us. For it takes a death to fully and finally separate us from that law on account of the holy and good thing constraining us, holding us fast to itself as those unable to escape its grasp. There are no gradations. There are no partial Christians. It's as stark a contrast as life and death. As born and not born. It's the same fundamental truth that our Lord spoke to Nicodemus. A person who is wishing to enter the kingdom of God must be born once again. To remain as they are is all wrong. Nothing but a divine supernatural intervention from God can possibly cause this rebirth. It is a gross misrepresentation of the law. Both the explicit law of Moses and the works of the law written in the hearts of the Gentiles. It is a denial of of the plain truth of Scripture to think that you may be saved or sanctified by looking to the law. It cannot save. It can only condemn. For it can only arouse the sinful passions within us. It defines sin. It makes plain to us the nature of our sin and our desperate need for a Savior. But the law produces only death. But now, now that we are in Christ Jesus, we who have faith like that of Abraham in the finished work of Jesus Christ alone, now we have been released from that law. It formerly constrained us. It had possessed us. It held on to us. It would not let us go. It would not give us up. It demanded custody of us that the transgression would increase, is what Paul wrote in Romans 5. Speaking of this very thing, Martin Lloyd-Jones aptly writes this, every man, until he becomes a Christian, is in bondage under the law. He is held by it. He is dominated by it. He is married to it. It controls him and governs the whole of his activity. Try as we might, we could never find justification through the law. For Romans 3.20 says it this way, By works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. <clears throat> in fact, rather than help from a certain perspective, we were hindered by the law. For as we became ever more aware of what was sin, the more those sinful passions were aroused within us. But now, 
But now we've been released from that same law which once held us, which once dominated us. And that release came through our union with Christ Jesus. This is why we took so many weeks to look at Romans 7, 4, where he says, So, my brothers, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. We were joined to Christ Jesus, and in his death on the cross, we died on the cross through that organic union with him. His death became our death. His burial became our burial. His resurrection became our resurrection to new life. And so the law, which once constrained us, which once dominated us, is now powerless over us. It can no longer condemn us. Romans 7.1 reminded us the law is master over a person as long as he lives. Through our death, we are released from our first husband, the law. And we have once and for all died to that by which we were constrained. And as certainly and as surely as if we had been a wife bound to her husband, whose husband has now died and she is free to marry another, even so we are now no longer bound to our former husband, the law. Not by the law's death. Be clear on this. Paul is very careful in what he says here, both to bring out the point in a manner that we can understand our new freedom to be married to another in verses 2 and 3, and then in 4 through 6, he's clear that it is we who have died even though we yet live now in Christ Jesus. For the law can never die. God's word has been established as certain and as eternal. I'd remind you of Psalm 119, verse 89, declaring forever, O Yahweh, your word stands firm in heaven. Rather, it must be our death. Through our organic union with Christ Jesus, which frees us now to be married to Jesus Christ, to him who was raised from the dead. And it is this last part, that we are now married. In, in truth, it's betrothed. We have not yet consummated the marriage to Christ Jesus, which brings us to the point in the purpose of the entire chapter. So that, in this last phrase, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit and not in oldness of the letter. It's much the same idea that Paul had introduced in Romans 7-4, in order that we might bear fruit for God. But now he's adding to it. He's expounding on it. He's going further than he'd had in verse 4, and we are well advised to pay attention as he does so. For just as he brings into verse 4 the first half of Romans 6. Even so, here he reminds us of the principles laid out in the second half of Romans 6. When we read serve, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit and not in oldness of the letter, it's a good translation. It's a proper translation. However, that's more due to our lack of capabilities in our western minds the word here in the greek is duleo it means more along the lines of to slave than to serve this is the same idea expressed in romans 6 16 we once presented ourselves as a slave to sin we were we slaved for sin got that it's a verb we did it we slaved for sin. And now we who are in Christ Jesus slave for obedience unto righteousness. And so now as we apply this idea in our present verse, we slave in newness of the Spirit and not slaving in oldness of the letter. 
As a slave serves his master, so do we in Christ now serve God in the newness of the Spirit. Now, if you, there are some translations that, that add the word way into this. Uh, ESV and NIV among them will say, we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. That's a wrong translation. It's a very poor translation. That word way completely alters what Paul is actually saying in the Greek. If you have one of those translations that add the word way, I would actually go so far as to say, take your pen and strike that out. It's not in the original. And it changes our, how we think about this. It is these two contrasts, old as opposed to new, spirit as opposed to letter, that help us understand that Paul is talking in terms of the new covenant here. The only other place in Paul's writings where he brings these two terms together, spirit and letter, is in 2 Corinthians verses 3, 5, and 6. And there we read this, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Once again, these terms are shown to be in opposition to one another. Yet in Corinthians, Paul takes it even further, making it even more plain and clear that he's, taking, he's talking about covenant language when he's talking about the letter and the Spirit. And the letter opposed to the Spirit. And the new in each of these verses is the word kainos. Both when he says new covenant in 2 Corinthians or newness of spirit in Romans, it's not merely something that is young in terms of its chronology. That would be neos. That's, that's totally different, right? Instead, he uses kainos to speak of an original quality something not really seen or experienced before. Where did Paul get this idea? From the very scriptures that he knew and he loved since his childhood. So I want to take probably most of the rest of our time to look to the Old Testament and see precisely what he's talking about. Now you're welcome to turn in your Bibles. I am going to put verses on the screen. I'm going to try to make this fairly clear. So we're going to start off by turning to Jeremiah chapter 31, which is the classic text, if you will, regarding the new covenant. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, Jeremiah starts writing, Behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I cut with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. But I was a husband to them, declares Yahweh. So we remember that the first covenant God cut with Israel came with smoke and fire. The mountain itself trembled, and the people were terrified at the voice of Yahweh from the mountain, such that they begged Moses to go up and speak with Yahweh alone, to be an intermediary for them. We read that in Exodus 19 and 20. But now Jeremiah is standing at the end of a very long line of disappointments. He's standing in a position of despair. Ten of the tribes of Israel had rebelled under Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, not just against their lawful king in Jerusalem, but also against God. In each successive generation turned worse and worse as they followed after the sin 
of Jeroboam in the sins with which he made Israel sin, provoking Yahweh to anger to the point where God eventually exiled them from the land of their inheritance at the hands of the Assyrians. And now, as Jeremiah writes this, a little more than a hundred years later, in his own lifetime, Judah is facing a similar crisis at the hands of the Babylonians. Jeremiah is all too aware of the cause for Judah's present distress. It's right here in Jeremiah 31, the people had broken the covenant. Even though Yahweh was a husband to them, he had wooed them, he had provided them an escape from the slavery of Egypt, he had secured their release and sealed it in their passage through the Red Sea. In his list of what he did for them went on and on and on. And yet still they had forsaken them at Kadesh Barnea. They refused to trust him at his word. And later when they finally entered the land under Joshua, they failed to destroy all of its inhabitants as they were commanded. Still later under the judges, they continually fell away. Even with the memory of Yahweh's glory filling the temple in Jerusalem, fresh in their minds, the next generation who were alive when Solomon's temple was completed rebelled against Rehoboam at Shechem. And the northern one of kingdom of Israel sunk ever more into depravity that was begun by Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. They went after other gods. And even then, after that, the kings of Judah continually rebelled against Yahweh despite knowing his word, despite having his law. And then we read in verse 33, but this is the covenant which I will cut with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law within them and on their heart I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. To be clear, in Romans, Paul is saying that not all are Israel who are descended from Israel. That's what he'll tell us in Romans 9. And in Romans 4, verses 16 and 17, he's already explained that it is by faith in order that it may be according to grace so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the seed. Not only those who are of the law, the Jews, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is a father of us all. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you. So this promise includes all who have a faith like that of Abraham. All who are justified by faith and thus are in Christ Jesus. That's what we learned in Romans 6. And married to, betrothed to Christ Jesus as we learn in Romans 7. So Jeremiah is declaring that the law will no longer be an external demand like the law of Moses that was given on tablets of stone. Instead, it will be an internal desire written on our hearts. God goes on to say in the next verse, this, and they will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, no, Yahweh, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares Yahweh. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. In other words, under this new covenant, there's going to be a personal, intimate relationship with Yahweh. God will no longer be a distant de deity that you only hear about from an old writing. 
He will be instead close. He will be a present companion to those who are partakers of this new covenant in which not only is he close and personal, but there is also forgiveness of sin and iniquities. Yeah, wow. This is worth getting excited about. Ezekiel 2 helps us to understand this new covenant. Starting in Ezekiel chapter 36, starting in verse 25, with God declaring much of the same as what he'd already declared to Jeremiah. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. It's the same thing as iniquity being forgiven and sins being remembered no more. But in addition to this being cleansed within, he goes on yet further in verses 26 and 27. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I'm going to stop there for just a second. That new in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures is kainos. It's the same phrase that Paul is using. I will put a new spirit within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to do my judgments. So now do you begin to see why I'm saying that Paul is invoking new covenant language in Romans 7, 6, where he said, but now we have been released from the law having died to that by which we were constrained, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit and not in oldness of the letter. I hope we're beginning to realize what Paul means when he contrasts this life in the new covenant with life under the old covenant. Do we realize it? I mean, do we comprehend in an earth-shaking world-shattering realization that shakes us to our, the core of our being, that even as the Israelites were shaken to the core of their being when God spoke to Moses in their hearing, such that they despaired even of life itself, should he continue, that we are not commanded to simply try to keep the law of Moses with more feeling, with more fervor, to have a better spirit than the Jews tried to do so failed and failed so miserably, we're not supposed to just try harder. No. It is for this reason that Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3 that he must be born again. It's not something additional you do on top of the law you already have. In verse 3, of John 3, Jesus had answered Nicodemus and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It is for this reason that Jesus answered the disciples of John who preached. Remember, John preached, make straight the way of the Lord. The essential difference in Jesus' own disciples was this, and it was, you find it in Matthew chapter 9, verse 16 and 17. No one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and a worse tear results. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wineskins burst, and the wine pours out, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. No, no. We had to be released from the law. 
We had to die to that which constrained us. In order that we are not only able, but will serve in newness of the Spirit. It's required. It does not work any other way. As a believer, we cannot look to the law as an external requirement. Can we learn from the law? Yes. It was written, it was recorded, Paul says in 2 Timothy, for our benefit. Peter wrote the same thing. That which was written before is written for our benefit. But we are to serve in newness of the Spirit. And we do serve. This is not a potential you might serve, you could serve if you do it the right way. It's you do serve in newness of the Spirit. This has happened to you. This is indicating your life now if you are in Christ Jesus. In other words, to focus ever and only upon morals and law and behavior as we encourage people to live the right way is to fully in... Maybe I should say it this way. If we do that, if we do focus upon morals and law and behavior to the world out there, we must realize it is fully and completely unable to bring about moral living. It is incapable of bringing people to do truly righteous actions. It cannot cause people to behave in a proper manner according to God. The only thing which can truly accomplish these things is the gospel of justification by faith alone, by grace alone, and the finished work of Christ alone. It is for this reason that Paul never moves very far away from the cross and Christ crucified. Even here, as he's talking about the law, it starts the central theme is we, we bring, Paul brings us right back to our union with Christ Jesus. This is what he did. It is a work of him. This is what is true of us who are in him. Any subsequent discussion starts with that. And we ought to imitate him in his, man, in his manner and thinking on this matter. If you're out there in the world, and you're thinking, what should I do? I don't know what to do. Start with the cross. Start with understanding what God has done for you. And what is the purpose for which God did this? It wasn't so that we can enjoy him forever. forever. It was for his glory forever. It is on account of that new spirit within us, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, that our thinking and our desires are changed from within. Rather than constrained from without, You can't expect the world to conform to truly Christian morals for they lack the spirit necessary for them to do so. We must not be surprised or shocked or offended when they don't do things that we see as being plain and evident and right. They can't because they don't have the spirit within us. How do we reach them? We proclaim Christ to them in Christ crucified. We proclaim the gospel to them that starts, just as we talked in, in verse 4, 
the gospel of Christ starts with man and his sin and his depravity and the glory of God and the inability of man to be able to reach to that glory because all have sinned, all have fallen short. Rather, we ought to pray for them that they might be brought to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they need. I can't spend my time railing against them. That's beating at the air. Right? It's not going to do any good. It may look kind of cool for at someone for a while, but our calling is to preach Christ and to preach Christ alone. They need Christ. We need to share him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for the day that you have given. I thank you for the newness of spirit that you have caused all who are in Christ Jesus to have. Father, it boggles my mind how this works, the mechanics. It, it doesn't work the way I understand science to work. And Father, I know and I understand and I recognize and I give you glory because it doesn't work how science works. But rather, Father, it is a supernatural miracle which you and you alone accomplish. And I am humbled beyond measure that you have chosen to make a something of me who deserves only condemnation and divine punishment. And yet, Father, out of your grace, you've given me something else. I pray that all who hear this would be drawn to you. That through this message and through the other messages in this series, you would be glorified beyond measure. And Father, I pray that we as, as believers, as Christians, as those who are joined to Christ Jesus organically, and now through that joining and that separation from the law, betrothed to Jesus Christ as the bride of Christ. Father, I pray that we would seek to do things which please him on account of his greatness, on account of who he is. and that we would worship you in spirit and in truth. I thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. And for his glory and honor, I pray. Amen. You've been listening to a free message from Hickory Corners Bible Church. You're welcome to pass this recording along to others, but please don't charge for it or alter it without written permission from Hickory Corners Bible Church. For more information about us, please visit us online at hickorycornersbible.org. There you can connect with us as well as join in supporting this ministry. You can also follow us on Facebook and YouTube to see the latest messages from our teaching and preaching ministries. Again, our website is hickorycornersbible.org.